Welcome, everybody. I'm Richard Shinas. I'm the Dean of the Dietrich College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the latest version of the Dietrich Deep Dives. Uh, our purpose in doing these was to take issues that were germane to the election and the world today, uh, and then go beyond the kind of coverage we get in the newspaper, which is sometimes uh, frustratingly shallow, and engage the experts we have on campus uh, to talk more deeply about these issues. So it's a pleasure today to welcome Mark Hamlet. Kathy Newman is going to host uh, and moderate the session uh, to talk about misinformation and cable news. So uh, uh, let me introduce Kathy Newman. She's an associate professor in our English department, and she has uh, taught a grand challenge seminar with Mark Hamlet on inequality and on many other interesting good pieces of work on media studies at large. So she is the perfect host for this. So Kathy, thank you for doing this and uh, I'll let you take it away. Great, thank you, Richard. Um, I'm excited to introduce Mark today. Mark Camlet is University Professor of Economics and Public Policy with joint appointments in the Department of Social and Decision Sciences. And he's also a Provost Emeritus at Carnegie Mellon. That's where I met Mark for the first time during his time as Provost when he had a reputation for being a bit of a hatchet man. But then he and I became teaching colleagues. And for the last three years, Mark and I both created and taught a large Dietrich College freshman lecture course on the topic of inequality. Teaching that class has been one of the great joys of my life here at CMU. One thing I learned working closely with Mark is that he really can see around corners. Mark spent time in a variety of meetings around the world in January and February of 2020, but before the pandemic had been widely understood. Based on what Mark was seeing in those meetings, he made a note to himself, buy stock in Zoom. Uh, so here we are uh, together uh, on Zoom, uh, and I'm excited to um, have us uh, have this wonderful presentation by Mark today on uh, cable news and misinformation. Take it away, Mark. So go ahead and unmute me, I guess. Can, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Yep. So I'm very happy to be here for this uh, Dietrich deep dive and um, I'll get right to it. Um, I thought I would get right to it. Let's try this, there we go. So I should say from the outset that this is a joint work that I've uh, been doing with uh, uh, three other people. One of them is Ashik uh, uh, Kudabush, who is a wonderful researcher in our Language Technologies Institute at CMU. Another is Rupak Sarkar, who is, <laughs> believe it or not, an undergraduate at a university in India who can more than hold his own in machine learning and language translation. The, the um, Third is Tom Mitchell. Tom Mitchell is the founder and uh, longtime head of CMU's uh, machine learning department and, and then myself. Um, I, I should mention that a lot of this research sort of came from a PhD class that Ashik and Tom and I taught this past fall. Um, it was a course called uh, Tracking Political Sentiments Using uh, Machine Learning. Um, we, we, we cut the enrollment at, at 20, and, but did have a waiting list and um, had uh, students from machine learning and language technologies at Dietrich College in Hines. So it was, it was really a fascinating experience for us. The, the group of us um, have uh, published uh, and written and published a number of academic papers from this. We have also some opinion pieces that we put together that had been picked up um, by um, places like Wire, a magazine called Wired and something, a periodical called Salon. And these things have gotten a, a good amount of attention. So I'm happy to get a chance to talk about them a little bit. What we'll be talking about in terms of the political setting is the um, last couple years of President Trump's presidency and the period um, of the campaign we have some other papers on the period between the election itself and the attempt to take over the Capitol, but we won't get to those today, I don't think. Um, 
the it's been much researched and much noted that over the past few decades, the American political system has become much more polarized at the, at the national level. And what we're going to be interested in is how is it polarized and, and why. Um, I'm going to talk initially about the how. Our paper tries to shed some light on how it's polarized. And then we'll turn hopefully to uh, some questions about why and why this came about. There's a lot of ways that researchers have used to try to get a handle on this polarization. One of them is to use voting records from people in Congress, from representatives and senators. This is an example where this is for the 116th Congress, uh, which was 2019 through 2020. And for every uh, legislator and for every vote on every bill, is fed into a, 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 a package that I won't go through the details of how it works, but it ends up placing each legislator um, on this uh, two-dimensional grid. Um, the, vertical, the horizontal dimension goes from liberal to conservative on economic issues, on redistributive issues. And the uh, vertical axis goes from liberal to conservative uh, on uh, social issues and, 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 and issues about race. When you feed this into the, the data into the computer, you are not telling the computer who's a Republican and who's a Democrat. You only go back after this has generated the image and you go back and say, ah, this is this legislator and that person is or a Democrat or is a Republican. And you can see that the Democrats are in blue, the Republicans are in red, and there's just this huge divergence. It's sort of like ne ne never the two will meet. And, and if you did this exact same kind of way to process legislators votes 25 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you would get a chart that looks completely different than this. It would be just a big blob in the middle of votes, pretty tightly focused. And there'd be a little sense that the blue ones were a little bit on the left side here, and the red ones maybe a little bit more on, on the right, but, but not much. There's a lot of over overlap, and there were a lot of Republicans that were more liberal than some of the Democrats and, and, and vice versa. But, but this is kind of an indication of how uh, things have changed when we go today. We're not going to, I'm not going to talk about data using uh, legislators' votes. We're going to focus on cable news stations. And we have a lot of information on a lot of uh, cable news networks. But today, I'm just going to talk about Fox News and CNN News. They are the uh, two largest ones. And it turns out that um, all of these cable stations, these news stations, they have channels on YouTube. And um, in, a lot of people watch their news uh, through, through YouTube. And they, they go and they watch um, uh, Fox News, they watch CNN, and they can provide input. They can say whether or not they have a, whether or not they, they see each story, and they can say whether or not they like the story, they can say whether or not they dislike the story, and then they can give a comment. And somebody else can give a comment, and that somebody else could give a comment on that first comment, or they could give a comment of their own. And this represents um, sort of an amazing trove of, 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 of data. I'll notice, I'll, I'll mention that we, we collect the data on a whole lot of cable stuff. Uh, we have uh, uh, MSNBC, we have all the fringe right stations, we have BBC and a bunch of international stations. And we also have all of the cable things with the feedback and the comments from all the primetime comedies. And we even present that in, in the paper, but I, I won't have time to get to that. I'm gonna to stick to the uh, Fox News and CNN. And so what this, um, what this chart, this graph shows is it shows the average number of comments that exist through this YouTube mechanism for each of the videos and the different lines and colors are for different cable stations. And so you can see for CNN, which is the, the line in uh, blue, 
things didn't really get rolling on this whole cable situation with feedback and so forth until basically until Ron, uh, until Donald Trump got elected. And you can see that it, it's grown steadily and at its peak for CNN, there's over 6,000 comments for every every video, every news story video and, and its peak for Fox, it was a, a, well over 5,000. And so the data that we have just on these two cable stations, Fox and CNN, we have over 85 million comments and these are comments on over 200,000 videos. So we have a tremendous uh, uh, amount of data. And the way we approach this is through something called machine translation. And I'll try to make this as brief as I can, but I have to say a few words about it. So suppose that one wants to have a computer come up by itself with a dictionary from say English to Spanish. And if you do that, you can go from Spanish to English as well. And I wanna point out that you want this to happen, but the computer does not know English and it doesn't know Spanish. It doesn't know Spanish. Last um, five, six, seven, eight years, there've been some major breakthroughs in machine learning, which have allowed for big advances in machine translation. And machine translation is using machine as opposed to a person or other mechanisms to translate from one language into another. And how is this translation done now that you have this, uh, these set of al algorithms that are so powerful? It's done in three simple steps. So again, suppose you wanna translate, want the computer to come up with a, a dictionary from English to Spanish. And the first thing you do, maybe you have a, a bookcase with all your books and these books could be, they're all in English and they could be great novels. They could be airport self-help books. They could be newspapers, whatever. And you have a, a friend who speaks Spanish and they have such a bookcase, but it's in Spanish with Spanish books. And um, they, the, 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 you load all of your material from all your great novels and so forth into the computer as text. And your friend does the same in Spanish. These are not gonna be the same books. They don't have to be the same books. It's just providing a lot of data in English and then a lot of words in, in, in Spanish. And then you feed the computer a bunch of a few hundred pairs of what we call anchor words to get the algorithm going. So for example, one of the anchor words will be the word one. And the, the algorithm will, will basically be told, there is this word in English, it's called one. We're not gonna tell you what one means, but there it is, O-N-E. And we will tell you that it translates into uno in, in Spanish. We're gonna tell you the word house. We're not gonna tell you what a house is, but we will tell you that it translates to casa in Spanish and so forth. And so you just give uh, the uh, anchor words into the algorithm and the computer with all this information. And you go out, you get a cup of coffee, and you come back and voila, the machine translation algorithm will have generated a shockingly good English to Spanish and Spanish to English dictionary. And again, just to emphasize, remember the computer doesn't speak Spanish, it doesn't speak English. It's, it's really quite clueless. It doesn't know what a political party is. It doesn't know what a ham sandwich is. It's, it's, and it's equally clueless in both languages. So with this as background, here's what we did. What we did is we took all this information, all these comments from the cable news, uh, from the CNN and Fox, and we constructed two groups of individuals all the people had given comments. We had two groups of individuals based on their cable news viewing comments and their cable watching habits. And we put half of them, we put a, a group of them into what we called a CNN camp. And we put a group of them into what we called a Fox camp. Um, and then we pretended that the individuals in one group spoke a language or speak a language that we called CNN speak. And we pretended that this other group was speaking a language called Fox speech. And we decided to use the same approach as from translating from English to Spanish, to translate from CNN speak to Fox speak. And, and, and for our book bookshelves, we used all the millions of the comments that, that, that we had gathered and we loaded them in and we 
threw some anchor words into the computer. We went out and we got some coffee and we came back and voila, we had a CNN speak to French speak dictionary. And then by virtue of that, it was a Fox speak to CNN speak dictionary as well. And at, at first glance, this might um, appear to be um, really quite silly, uh, probably at second, third and fourth glances as well, because obviously the two groups are both speaking in English. <laughs> and so a CNN speak to Fox speak dictionary should be just a plain English to English dictionary. And there could be, of course, a few exceptions. For instance, if you were going from, say, American English to British English, you would you, you would learn that the, the word that in English is barrette would translate into a word called hair slide in, in, in English, because that's what the British English, but, but it's very easy to clarify in situations like that, that those are two different ways of saying the same thing. And indeed that's how it should be for all words really between CNN speak and Fox speak. If you take the word car in CNN speak, you would anticipate that it translates into car in Fox speak and, and spelled the same way, pronounced the same way and meaning the same thing. Ditto for horse to horse or red to red, et cetera. And, and so on for the 25,000 common English words that, that uh, should, <laughs> each word should just more or less be translating into itself. And so this seems not only a little silly but also pretty boring and, and useless. And furthermore, we ask why, why would political words be any different than car and everything else? Because after all, the computer doesn't know what a political word is. It doesn't know the difference between a political word and a non-political word. So why, why should there be anything special about that? And what we imagined would be something as follows. These, the, the, these are sample um, comments that I just made up, but they, they make the point. And we imagine there's a comment in CNN speak that says, poor and middle-class people are doing badly economically and the rich are getting richer. Democrats want to raise taxes on the rich to make things more equal. And we imagine there's a Fo Fox speak comment that says, Democrats want to raise taxes on the rich, which destroys incentives for businesses to grow and to hire more poor and middle-class people. And confronted with these two comments, you'll notice that each contains basically the same chunk of a sentence, identically. Democrats want to raise taxes on the rich. Democrats want to raise taxes on the rich. And the way the algorithm works, it's, it's gonna say, aha, I figured something out. Want translates into want, two translates into two, taxes, translates into taxes and Democrats translates into Democrats. So that was what we were sort of anticipating uh, that, 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 that we would, would, would find. Um, and that it would just do the original, it would just do what it does for every other word. Democrats will translate into Democrats and Republicans in, in, into Republicans. But what we found was not what we expected. And we stumbled into, when we did this, we stumbled into a prominent pattern for words and seemingly just for words that had political connotations. The patterns that we found were really quite extraordinarily odd and I'll talk about them. They were certainly unexpected to us. And actually there was no name for this kind of pattern in the machine translation literature. And what we found was we found for political words, we kept finding words in our CNN speak to Fox speak dictionary that had three features. First of all, the political word from CNN speak got translated into a word in Fox speak that was not the same word. It wasn't spelled the same and it didn't sound the same. Well, that's no big deal, sort of. If we had something from English to Spanish, we'd have the word house and then you'd see that it translates into casa and you'd notice that casa is not the same word as house. So. It's spelt differently, it's pronounced differently. So this, this first feature um, is what we expected, but you, you get that in a lot of dictionaries. The second is, however, that you could take the word, you take the political word in CNN, you translate it into Fox, and then you take that word from Fox speak and you come back and you look it up 
in your CNN dictionary and it exists. And that's the part that's very, one of the parts that's very strange. If you did this with the casa and house in Spanish, you say house, you get casa, you would take casa, you go take it back to your, to, to your, your English dictionary and you look, there is no word in English that, that's casa. And that's where what we found was different. Every time we got the political translation that was different than the CNN speak, we brought it back and the CNN speak was in the dictionary. And not only was it in the, 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 the CNN speak diction, uh, dictionary, but it wasn't close to the original CNN speak word. In fact, it seemed to mean the, the mirror opposite. And I think I can best um, per perhaps um, make sense of this by, by, by just giving you some examples. So these are real examples, unlike the other ones that I, that I made up. And these are the real examples that, uh, that the computer and the algorithm were, were dealing with. So the first one is an, uh, was a comment from CNN speak that says, Republicans are the greatest threat to Americans that the nation has ever seen. They will have willingly enabled a, a tyranny and a wannabe dictator. And the real comment from a Fox speak was, had Trump put more restrictions on travel sooner, Democrats would have been crying racism. Democrats are the greatest threat to Americans. And now you see there's almost the exact same sentence. Republicans are the greatest threat to Americans. Democrats are the greatest threat to Americans. And the computer algorithm is going to do just what it did before. It's going to say, ah, I get it. Greatest translates into greatest. Threat translates into threat. But Republicans translates into Democrats. And that is the part that is uh, so unusual and, 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 and so different. Uh, I'll give you some other examples that display the same thing. Uh, a CNN speak, the real comment is the Republicans are traitors, full stop. All good and patriotic Americans must see this, recognize it for what it is, and begin to act accordingly. Uh, a, a real life uh, Fox uh, speak. The Democrats are traitors and should be rounded up and exiled to an island. So again, the computer sees these two things and says, ah, for some reason, when a, uh, somebody on CNN speaks says Republican, what you want to do if you want to get the same message across, just call them Democrats, which of course is not true because Republicans <laughs> are distinctly different from, from Democrats, but that's what the, the poor um, translation algorithm thinks. A last example, what a liar. I've always voted for the man, not the party, but after the way the Republicans have acted, I will never vote Republican again. Or a Fox speak comment, I used to vote for Democrats because I thought they cared about people. Now they only care about non-American poor people. Talk about being non-American. I will never vote Democrat again, Democratic again. And time after time, we have hundreds of these in which they're the exact same, um, sentence except for the flipping of, of um, their, their use of the parties. And um, we found the same sort of pattern to exist, not only for Republican and Democrat. You, you could pick in, any political word and, 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 and you'd see something similar. So if, if you took Kushner, the word Kushner and in, in, in the CNN speak, if you wanted to tell somebody what Kushner meant uh, according to the translation to the dictionary for, for, for Fox speak, you would say Burisma. Now we didn't tell it to come up with that. That's what it came up with. Burisma, as you all probably know, is the um, Ukrainian gas company that, that, that uh, Hunter Biden was supposed to be on the, um, uh, what was, was on the board of. The, the same for Nazi and Antifa. The, the, what um, CNN speak called Nazi, um, Fox be called Antifa. There's even some humorous ones, weasel and bar. So if you wanted, if you're a, a, a Fox speak uh, person and you want to talk about uh, Attorney General Barr, you want to communicate that to uh, uh, CNN speak people, you'd be best off using the word weasel because that's the one they'll recognize. And the same is true for impeachment and sham. And the same to our amazement, because we certainly didn't tell it to come up with this, the same was true for KKK, for Ku Klux Klan, and for BLM, um, for, um, for Black Lives Matter. And um, 
uh, as I say, the computer came up with this without, without our prompting. And this was something that we considered quite amazing. We considered it very alarming. And we felt that it distilled in one example, the degree of polarization that exists in American politics. Now, our, our, our paper goes on to do a lot of other things that I'm not going to have a time to, um, to go into today. Um, but um, what I want to do now, with that as kind of the background, is I want to reflect. This is no longer the research paper, but I want to reflect on um, some musings that I have from our work uh, on the paper. What does it mean for the patterns that we found? For, for one thing, it, it appears that there is acute polarization in the US at the national level circa 2020. And this polarization that we find is, is quite unique in the context that it's, 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 not, it's not the arts that are polarized. It's not, it's not sports that are polarized. It, this happens only for these political words that we throw up. Um, and, and said in another way, that for political discourse, there is very little or no common ground. And this seems a very dangerous place for a country to be. That was first. Secondly, you can notice that the discourse is not communication of nuanced facts or deeply thought through lines of reasoning. Th this in fact doesn't seem to be the purpose of why people give comments. Rather, the comments are, they're really just based on simplistic cultural memes that they throw back and forth. Third thing to observe is the comments are at best fourth grade level name calling. I mean, these are not sophisticated back and forth. Uh, many of the comments and the interactions can be summarized pretty much by saying, by the following, you're stupid. No, you're the one that's stupid. No, it's you that's stupid. That's what this boils down to a lot. Fourth, in, in musing about fake news and misinformation, um, one may need to go back and refine the very sense that we have about what it is that people are doing when they're trying to talk to each other and, and gather new information by listening to each other, at least with regard to politics. Um, naively, we sort of think that, you know, what, what do you do? You, you, you listen to somebody and then you learn something and, and, and you revise your thinking accordingly. So you, you may think you're really good at baking a cake and you have a recipe and do such and such. And then you watch an episode of a very popular baking show on YouTube called How to Cake It. And you are you entertained and you are amused but you also learn that, you know, you should set the, the, the oven should be 20 minutes at 300 degrees, not 15 minutes at 325. And you have learned something and you've sort of changed what you're going to do. That's how we sort of envision things. There's an alternative theory of information seeking behavior that our results sort of speak to. And that alternative theory is that a main reason people seek information, at least in politics, is basically just to have their point of view supported. They don't want to be influenced by the informa by information that does not fit with their initial points of view. If they hear information that does not fit comfortably, that information is decried as being fake and false. And because so many others are also decrying that information as being fake and false, um, um, it, it, it confirms that. And for the original person he feels or she feels that their original position is if anything strengthened. And this is a very different way of looking at the, the whole nature of how we envision what political communication is all about. I want to shift gears then to the last set of things I'm going to talk about, which is, so why on earth did this come to be? Why is it that this seems to be the state of affairs? I'm going to give you about four or five reasons. And these are just reasons that I think ha hold, hold some credibility. It, it is the case that over about 50 years, maybe longer, of economic uh, history in the US, there has been growing in economic inequality. That, that's just a, a fact. Uh, much of the middle class during this period has been treading water economically. 
and far too many in, the pop, in our population have been going backwards over this prolonged period of time. And this leads to angry people. This is true for underrepresented minority communities um, who experience the brunt of the economic inequality and growing inequality, but it's also true for members of non-minority communities. And they, the members of the non-minority communities are doubly mad because they make scapegoats of the minority communities um, who they think are being helped unfairly at, at their expense. So I think one reason is wrapped up with the entire history of the economic uh, story of America over the last 50 years plus and the growing uh, inequality leading to a lot of very angry people. Uh, a, 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 a second potential reason is, is that anybody who's sort of involved with this would I think agree that to some degree, the economic inequality that America has experienced is, has been influenced by three things. One of them is that US jobs have been outsourced to workers in other countries. Two is because of the amazing advances in computing and information and communication technologies, and now machine learning, those are things that advance productivity, but they can also take away and displace jobs. And then third, there have been tax cuts that uh, um, are major agendas of, of, of various presidents that um, um, represent government actions that advantage the rich. And this set of phenomena sort of going in parallel with the economic record leads to a deep distrust of key social institutions, including governments, including political parties, and as we unfortunately know, even notions like democracy. I think a third thing that lies behind what's happened is gerrymandering. Gerrymandering um, has left there being very few competitive congressional districts. If you are elected twice to the US Congress, the odds that you're going to be defeated by a candidate of the other party are less than was true of the Politburo in the Soviet Union in its height. Um, the gerrymandered districts are, are very safe. And so Republican congresspersons are not afraid of the general election, nor, nor, nor are Democrats. They're, they're not going to lose in the general election. They're going to lose in the primary when a candidate goes either further to the left or to the right or further to the left of them. And that's just the world we, we, we now live in, which of course just has natural tendency to pull, pull the polls apart. Fourth, there is what I might call the Trump effect. Uh, Trump is, say anything else, uh, an extraordinarily talented, has been an extraordinarily talented Pied Piper for the political age that we find ourselves in. And one is very hard pressed to find analogous presidents or presidential candidates even in the past that have been so charismatic to so many. In fact, I would say even looking to 2024, there's certainly gonna be many that try, but it doesn't look like there's anybody who's quite got whatever it is that Trump has, except for, for, for Trump, for Trump them, them, themselves. And then fifth and last, we wanna get back to social media per se. And what social media has done is it has taken away many of the gatekeepers that have previously been a key part of societal communication. The, these gatekeepers aren't around anymore. The gatekeepers are the ones heretofore that sort of provide the required common ground for a civil society. Uh, this is not a common ground that resolves issues, but it's a common ground that allows communication with one another on issues. This is what the, these gatekeepers do. And illustratively, I mean, it used to be, and it still is a rather harrowing experience to write an op-ed and try, try to have it run in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. If, and for any of you who experienced this, you go through an enormous amount of editorial reaction and feedback that's provided by these very thoughtful people. These are the gatekeepers. And you have to pass it through the gatekeepers 
before your communication is going to go out in a forum that a lot of people are going to see it. And, and that's not what the case is now. Moreover, traditionally, think of newspapers. Newspapers have traditionally been bound to devote much attention to separating news from opinions. The folks that are in charge, the reporters that are in charge of the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, they're firewalled from the, those reporters responsible for the news. And they say, this is the news. This is our opinion section. Don't get the two mixed up. Up until the Reagan administration, there was for radio and television stations, they were bound by something called the equal time rule and by the FCC's fairness doctrine. And, and those went away in 1987. In 1996, we had the communications decency law, which included a section called section 230, which provides immunity from liability for providers, that is from the the Facebooks or the YouTubes or the whatever, from providers that publish the stuff that is put on their channels uh, by third and their platforms by third party users. And I don't want to give away any secrets, but the goal of these providers in the end is to make money. And they do this by attracting eyeballs. And this is done much better by having there be incendiary and controversial items that capture people's attention and the more outrageous, the, the, the better. Now you can trans anybody really um, within the platform or just an individual can press a button and send out to all their followers, whatever um, one has put, there's no filters, there, there's no gatekeepers. And we now demonstrably are in a situation where communication, there's nothing more comforting or convincing than an echo chamber. And this is, I think, where I want to uh, stop the presentation. I've tried to explain what we did using um, machine learning and machine translation to get a portrait of the nature, hopefully shed some light on the nature of political polarization at the national level um, within the United States. And then I've tried to tie it back to certain features which you may or may not agree with me on but which I think are worth thinking about in terms of trying to reconcile and explain where we've come. And I guess that is where we are. So I'm gonna turn it back to Kathy and to you all to see if you have any questions or disputes or, or anything you'd like to add. 